here today on uh, June 14th, Black Day. Um, presidents like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln have their birthdays and celebrate, the nation still celebrates in patriotic ways. My sister-in-law, Tammy, has birthday today and demands that the entire nation celebrate in a patriotic way as well. Happy birthday, Tammy. <laughs> slide up the, the, the total pole there just a little. Uh, but anyway, we want to encourage you, if you are watching from home, send in prayer requests if you are not, to uh, think of any phrases or prayer requests that you might have here in the room. Um, one specific, well, a couple that I want to mention here this morning. First off, tomorrow is Mr. Cole's 99th birthday. And we would like to do a, if there's interest, we'd like to do maybe a drive-by, and we were arrange it where we could go up and kind of just right past the front door. Um, well, we have to get that all set up. We have to have a time, and uh, they'll get him in the right spot. We're going to see if we can get Mrs. Dustin there, even though it's not her birthday, but basically her half birthday, almost. A little go. past her half birthday. Uh, but we get the two of them uh, there at the door, and then do a drive-by. But only if there's enough interest, we don't want to have them drag them all outside if, if there's not enough people that are interested in going. That'll be tomorrow, probably tomorrow evening, if it works. For you all here who are at home, let us know, and preferably today, so that we can let them know first thing in the morning um, while management is in the building, and then they'll make the arrangements for them at the right time for us. So that'll be tomorrow. Let us know today. That'll work for you tomorrow. <laughs> Probably, I would guess, like 6, 6.30. We've be been there at 6 o'clock on Wednesday nights, mm -hmm. and you're obviously done with your meal. And I think so that should work there as well. And um, so let us know if that works for you. Then as well, as far as our state goes, it looks like um, here in a couple of weeks, the last what, Friday of June, mm -hmm. we'll be hitting to the next stage. I'm somewhat hesitant because of all the uh, protests that we've had. Uh, I know that Illinois hit the state, uh, hit the news, nationwide news this last week because we had the lowest number or at the best track rate, uh, which I think is ridiculous how that is recorded because we also shut down, our governor shut down all testing because of the protests. So obviously we're gonna be at the lowest because we're not testing. <laughs> uh, I know that uh, it's assumed uh, my boss's son who lives in Chicago uh, a week or two ago, had a horrible fever, horrible headache, and just felt like he got hit by a truck. Pretty convinced he had it. Not a place he could go to get tested to find out. Um, and so, not a surprise that we have such great numbers. We are in Peoria. They reopened a couple just last week because John had to have a COVID test yes. last Sunday. And they had quite a line of people. Um, and then I saw the paper, the Peoria paper, that they had reopened another one at the Civic Center. Oh, yes, so yes. So it must have been that they either had people getting sick or... Yes. So I, I expect that suddenly our numbers are going to be bad because we have to be on a, a holding at or decreasing. If we have more than a certain percentage increase, then we get stuck in this stage. And um, if we stop testing, then that's when we start testing again, and now the numbers jump from here to here just simply because we stopped for about two weeks. Um, suddenly, we uh, are here in the next couple of weeks, see what's gonna happen uh, as far as what will be allowed. I think the only real change for us, in fact, I don't know there'll be really any change for us, um, <laughs> since we are already at 25% capacity or less. Uh, I think starting on that last Friday of June, we're able to go up to 50 people. Um, and I haven't heard there, I've heard rumors that we were no longer required to have masks, but his paperwork, his literature says that masks are still required for phase four. So I don't, I don't, uh, everything is so fluid these days. But the hope is, is that uh, we can begin to get a little more closer to normal if we're able to move uh, to this next phase and uh, we'll have to figure out what, to what will be our new normal. <laughs> and uh, so, so to keep that in your prayers, I think, I think churches have a great opportunity for a, how should we say, a reset on uh, what they do and how they do it and why they do it, 
And uh, I think it would be good for us to be aware of what what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, and uh, what's going to be our new normal. Um, I don't mean to get in the message before we even start with the word of prayer, but already the churches in general, not just speaking ours, churches in general already have moved more into a spectator sport, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, about a decade ago, it was said that 20% uh, of the people were doing 80% of the work. And uh, I think across the board, coast to coast, that number's shrinking. Uh, less than 20% are doing even more than 80% of the work. Uh, in church, in average churches across America today, well, you shut down churches for three months where the only thing that you can do is watch from home. Um, uh, we as a local church, but the church as a whole has got to figure out, we've got to take a big jump and not get back to what we used to be, but we got to get back to more than we used to be. Uh, as far as activity, uh, but the, the tendency would be to drop even less of what we used to be as far as activity and service and ministry. That help you that all, Kate? Does it? So we, uh, this morning we had the, the plan that if uh, what we've been normally doing with our nifty little screen changes and all that wasn't working, we were going to go right back to um, one camera, Facebook Live, no extra software, no, back it has nothing to do now, no buttons to push. And let's see if that improves. And it sounds like it may, may be improving some. So we'll see how this works. But that just means you gotta focus on me, I guess, for the rest of the service. <laughs> um, but anyway, do we have any prayer requests or praises here this morning? Michelle gave a praise that someone in the past of concern, it's like someone gave testimony of salvation, but then that caused another person who's really acting out because of it. So it's still a prayer request, but there's a praise. And then Hannah is at the, she has one month to go to her due date. So she's really getting into the safe zone. Yes. And that's a miracle that she's lasted. Yes. Her baby, her pregnancy has gone this long. So. Correct. Very good. And an update on Larry. <clears throat> John and I have never met Larry and his wife Sandy, but our good friends are good friends of theirs. And they had a conference call with Mayo. And sadly, they felt like they were just completely blown off. They oh, said no. that Mayo is so swamped with medical concerns that they told Larry that he was not a high priority. But in actuality, he's basically dying. Yes. And it was very discouraging for them as a couple because they need some guidance whether or not he should have a bone marrow transplant. Yeah. So, I mean, it's at the point now where it's make a decision or just face the end. So he did get, did get blood this week. Um, but I, I feel really bad that our medical system is overwhelmed in some areas and people that really need it are not getting it either. Yes. Yeah, that's very, very sad. Great for Larry and sort of the family involved. You had any others, correct? Um, I was just thinking we could continue to prepare for the wilds. All the staff showed up this weekend and they start training this week. So they're preparing for training. Yes. One of uh, the evangelists, David David Young, who was my floor, what do you call that, leader, floor leader at one school in my freshman year, uh, has been an evangelist. And uh, he posted recently on Facebook that if your church does not have access to a Bible camp, that he or someone you could recommend could come to your church and put on, you know, uh, a week of services for teens, basically have your in-house camp. And uh, so he kind of posted that, and then one of the comments was, the Wilds opens up next week, or whatever it was, with exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. I'll certainly be praying for them. I know there's a lot of camps well that aren't opening at all. Uh, camp insurance here in this state is opening, and they immediately filled up. And uh, so they pushed, kind of squeezed in, another week for both eight 
brackets, and uh, that one's filling up now. Um, but it's it's a challenge for the camps uh, that are trying to minister to kids that now they have to worry about spacing and capacities and um, the the germ side of me is always concerned about camps because the kids are going from one place to the other to the food to another place to the food to the mud pit to the food to the bed. <laughs> Uh, but that's certainly a whole other ballgame now. I guess I could give a, a, a praise for Beth. Um, she texted me this morning and said that she saw her brother Dan, who has oh, yes. cancer, on a virtual baby shower for Hannah. Okay. And that he looked just like himself. That he nice. has improved enough that she said, in just in looking at him, he looked so good. And very of course, good. she was very happy. Yes. After that. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Did you get anything, Kate? Nothing. Did anybody catch up to your new Michelle? Michelle did. <laughs> well, let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you again for all that you are, that all that you continue to be. We thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. We thank you for the challenges that you allow in our lives to remind us of who you are and at times that ultimately remind us of who we are. And uh, I just pray that you be with those that were mentioned here this morning. We do certainly do pray for Hannah. We thank you that uh, she is here in this last month and and a lot of the concerns that are beginning to diminish as far as the timing goes. We thank you for that. And I just pray that here this last month that uh, you just continue to protect the baby and Hannah and as well uh, all the others that are involved and are going on this journey together. I just pray that you certainly be with them here in this last month. So you pray for this uh, CASA concern that uh, Michelle has shared and certainly the rejoicing of, of someone giving a profession of faith and as well the difficulty in regards to some uh, resistance by others. I just pray that you would uh, soften hearts uh, that uh, perhaps as what is seen now of great resistance is actually an internal struggle of the reality of, of truth in their own hearts. And I just pray that you would soften the heart, that they would understand in a fuller way their own need for you. And uh, I just pray that you you do a work in a heart and a life. And uh, we, we know that you are always about that work. And I just pray that we'd be able to rejoice and, and life change. Uh, here in that scenario, in that home, in that situation. And you certainly do pray for Larry as well. I asked this morning that you would just encourage their hearts. Uh, certainly a rough week, uh, this kind of feeling uh, set aside, so to speak, from uh, Mayo. I just pray that they'd be able to get direction, that you would direct their feet, direct their decisions, that they'd be able to find some uh, um, this counsel, medically speaking, in regards to what they should do next. And uh, I just pray that you would just comfort their hearts and um, that they'd be able to sense you through this. So we pray for the wilds and serve the camp insurance here in our state as well. And many other camps, good solid Bible preaching camps that are dedicated their ministries and so many have dedicated their lives to that ministry of, of reaching hearts, reaching teens, reaching young uh, kids for, for you and have an impact on lives. And certainly this virus has had a great impact on all of those camps. It's really good the wilds as they and they jump forward here and I believe in a week or two with their first week of camp. And I pray that you would indeed keep uh, the kids safe and healthy. Uh, certainly that um, their lives would be changed and impacted. And uh, I just ask that you would certainly be with all those that are working in behind the scenes, trying to make these decisions, trying to coordinate all those details. I just pray that you would direct and guide and that your word would be very clear in what time they're allowed to have together here this summer, and we thank you for that. The other requests, certainly we thank you for the praise of, of, of Dan to seem to be doing very well. I just pray that you would continue working there. I pray that you be with Michelle, as seems like she's had a, a long, rough week this week, pray that you give her rest today. And uh, Mary, as, as she's traveling, and I just pray as well that for each one of us, the needs, circumstances, the life, uh, that we are facing today. I just pray that you be honored and glorified and direct our steps accordingly. We give you the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we have two special musics, and if we can turn the camera, maybe. Um,
first, I believe, is my wife singing or just playing? Just playing. And then there is a quartet with guitar. Yes. 
Amen. Very good. If anybody is interested in joining them at special music, um, let my wife know. Usually every about Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, it's already a discussion. So what are we doing next week? <laughs> and uh, so if you're interested in joining them or doing special music or uh, if you're at home and would like to do it, obviously you can do it up on the screen, do it split screen, uh, like we've done in the past. Um, but anyway, certainly that's open. We can't, we're not recommended that we not sing uh, collectively yet. Um, I kind of missed that. <laughs> Looking forward to when we can do that. Uh, there are churches that have, that we can kind of follow to see what they're doing, that are working on, it's not working. <laughs> it's better, it's a better view that way. <laughs> well, welcome back. <laughs> there are churches that uh, we kind of keep an eye on, on on Facebook to see what they're doing, and several have done the outdoor, but this distance when they've done the singing, I think I say it sounds horrible, but it doesn't sound all that good because, well, when you're six feet apart from everybody, if you were facing the other way every Sunday when we sang, it seemed really weird singing up here. Uh, because you're so far away from everybody, it seems not like you're doing a solo. So when you're separated outside, it, it really doesn't, I don't know that you gain. You know, you gain the, you can sing, but you also gain the, what do you call that, the self-awareness of, I'm not going to sing very loud because someone's going to hear me. The truth is nobody can hear you because all they hear is themselves. Uh, but anyway, uh, looking forward to the day when uh, whatever the new normal is, is normal again and we are continuing on in Exodus uh, here this morning, Exodus chapter 16. As Lord willing, we're going to get to the, the chapter here. Very familiar fact, if there's anything that is known about uh, the Exodus, the journey from Egypt to uh, Canaan, it probably is this event specifically uh, that is probably most known. It's the Sunday school, what would you call that, the, uh, what that, uh, the board, the flannel graph uh, story of, uh, of manna. Uh, being provided in quails in the evening, manna in the morning. And uh, so we have that event in Exodus chapter 16. And in Exodus chapter 16, again, I, I'm not saying that we are leaving Egypt and heading into the into Canaan, into the promised land in our journey, but I can say this, that as we follow their journey and see how they responded, it is for our benefit, it's for our learning, for our gaining. And uh, how is it that they responded? How is it that they should have responded? And uh, how is it that we are responding, and more specifically, how is it that we should? And uh, so we'll be looking at chapter 16 here this morning. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Lord, we thank you again for your word. I thank you for the time together. I just pray that you would direct our uh, our steps here this morning to look to your word. I pray that you allow me to decrease, that you alone would increase, that the message would be clear to my heart as well as to all those that are listening. Uh, I just pray that you do a work in our hearts, our lives. That we would grasp for you, uh, that we'd be content with you, and we thank you for what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Call this, well, so far, several things you already know. As far as, if you recall, this is like our school, our school room setting. Uh, as far as our coronavirus or upheaval that are now in, politically speaking, uh, but we are to know the remedy, no peace, no longevity, no his presence, no praise, no what it is to truly trust. Last week we looked at know the task, which ultimately is the, the remainder of the book of Exodus, which we won't undoubtedly go through all the remainder of the book of Exodus. But know the test. And here this morning we want to look at uh, a knowing contentment. Now Benjamin Franklin is credited with saying this, contentment makes poor men rich, and discontentment makes rich men poor. Someone else said, contentment, in the, re in the topic of contentment, be content with what you have, but never with who you are. It kind of gives us the idea of uh, our progress and growth in Christ. A, uh, a story, and I, I try to do some fact-checking, and it seems to be legitimate. It's just one of those that's sometimes hard to believe. But have you heard the story of the uh, Golconda diamond mines in India? Never even heard of it until I was finding illustrations here this week. The legend goes this way, that a very wealthy man owned a very large amount of acreage in the area of, of India. He had orchards and grain fields and gardens, wealth and fame, and, and uh, uh, he had what everybody dreamed of having. Uh, because of his 
uh, eloquent lifestyle, he was often uh, able to host very important people uh, that would come in and uh, visit. And uh, one of those that came to visit him was from the east. Now it's funny when you're speaking of India to the east, because it, to my estimation, there's not a whole lot left to the east. But from the east there in India, uh, someone came and was explaining to him the, the, the diamond rush there in the east. Again, it's funny, in our nation, it was all about the West, <laughs> the, the gold rush in the West, and they had the diamond rush in the East. And so this man, his name was Ali Hafid, uh, decided that he was going to sell all that he had, all of his all of his estate, his acreage, his farm, his plantations, all of it. He sold, took the money, and he traveled east, uh, destined to find the mine that would make his name the most familiar name in the world around the diamonds. Well, Ali, Ali Hafed, on a journey, he searched, he dug, he mined, but never found what he thought or hoped he found. In fact, well, as the legend goes, having lost all of his fortune, now spent, having spent all the fortune that he had gained from the selling of all his property, all of his land, uh, his businesses, uh, he, he, he ended his life in great poverty. Now the legend continues on that the man who bought his property had some camels and was directing his camels to a body of water to, to allow them to drink. And as one of those camels put the, its nose in the water, he saw something sparkle. And pulling whatever that sparkling thing is out of the water, he found something that radiated the sun in every color imaginable. And that the Called Ganda Diamond Mine, which from my understanding is the largest diamond mine in the East, was found on the very property of a man who sold everything in search of what he didn't have. Probably the only thing he didn't have. And he lost it all. A better, a funnier, huh? that's one of those illustrations like, oh, uh, a funnier uh, illustration in this regard. Not the story is told of an American movie. A uh, company that filmed a kind of an African themed movie. It's funny how they can do African themed movies in Hollywood and make it look like they're actually in Africa. Well, there was one scene, I don't know what this movie is. Uh, I tried to do some search, I can't find, figure out what movie this is. like it could be. Uh, in this one scene of this movie, there was somebody that was rushing through the, the jungle, so to speak, of, of, of Africa to reach, head back to. A, a, a certain, uh, what do you call it, a colony, a uh, whatever, whatever you call it, a tribe. And uh, he had a very important message that he had to give to the chief. And so the scene shows this man running for three days, just constantly running for three days. And they needed somebody to write a one-sentence, very urgent message that could be spoken in some sort of African dialect for the movie scene. That basically made it very clear that whatever this man said, the danger that may be coming is, is shortly behind. And so here's the scene. Somebody ran three days, reaches the chief. He says this one sentence that they found somebody out in California that could write a one sentence urgent message in Swahili. So they practiced, they rehearsed the dialect. He said this one sentence in Swahili, and then he collapses on the ground, just of a complete exhaustion. Well, from my understanding, the scene went perfectly uh, and uh, made great reviews here in, in our nation. But they, the movie expanded and it actually was shown in Nairobi where they actually speak Swahili. And what was supposed to be one of the best scenes, or maybe not the best scene, but a, an important scene, a, kind of a pivot making scene here. Danger is arriving and I've run three days to tell you. What they heard in their own dialect was, I am not getting paid enough to do this job. <laughs> and then, <"Whoa." laughs> Well, obviously, hilarious if you spoke Swahili. For the rest of us, we just read the captions on the bottom and we just believe that what they say it says is actually what they, they said. Well, here in Exodus chapter 16, we have the entire nation of, of Israel uh, having made more than a three-day journey and ultimately saying the same thing in a collective sigh, I don't think we're getting paid enough to do this. And what's amazing is the journey that God takes them to remind them of 
at that moment. Now, for those that are interested in, in geography, you know where the, the what the Red Sea looks like. Kind of a, I guess we can do it this way. If I could smash my fingers more together, my palm, my hand together, the uh, Red Sea is more kind of instead of a flat circle like my hand hand is, but you can squeeze it together. It's a body of water, and then it's got two peninsulas. So I can do this in the right direction. And then up here is the Mediterranean Sea. Down here is Africa, more specifically Egypt, and the Sinai Peninsula, which is between my fingers here, is technically part of Egypt. And then uh, the promised land, Canaan, is right above it. Uh, and so they are heading from Egypt. They cross the sea. Now they're here in what we call the Sinai. This is going to be bad for sea, but it's right for me. But they're there right in this area for the Sinai Peninsula. Again, Mediterranean Sea is right here. Promised land is right here. And Mount Sinai is believed to be, they're not certain of where exactly Mount Sinai is, but it seems to be kind of right down here, right at the bottom. And uh, this Elihim, which they just finished or left, in verse 27, remember where they have uh, 12 wells and 70 palm trees. And we cross, that seems to be, they think, right up in this area. So if you switch it around, it would be this side. I think it's still the same, isn't it? So no, it's the opposite. So it would be here. Mount Sinai is here, and then they go up here to the promised land. So they're doubling back. But there's a reason that God's sending them to Mount Sinai. That makes sense. We come to chapter 16, verse 1. It says, they took their journey from Elim. And again, say it again. What was important about this? They have three days in the wilderness. The children of Israel, chapter 15, they first two-thirds of chapter 15 is them singing and dancing, praising God, rejoicing in what he has done, what he will continue to do. Three days in the wilderness. Now they're complaining, now they're murmuring, now they're belly aching. They finally get to some water, and it's bitter. Remember, Moses fixes it by throwing a tree in the water. Uh, for the rest of it, I wanted to post this picture, but I think for uh, lunch that day, uh, my wife fed me broccoli, which baked my treats. Just baking the lunch better with broccoli, I guess, with a tree. Uh, but Moses fixed, by God's leading, fixed the bitter water, turned it to sweet with a tree. And then they continue on, verse 27, and they came to Elohim, where there were twelve wells of water, and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. We don't know exactly how far. We know that they left on the 15th day of the first, the first month as God restarts their calendar. Uh, as they leave Egypt, we know that they wandered. We know that they camped a couple times before crossing the water. We know that they were obviously there at the bitter water for at least a night. And uh, we know that then they came to Elohim. They, they arrived here in this wilderness one month after leaving. So they've been gone now for a month. You can follow the calendar. The 15th day of the first month, they've left Egypt. The 15th day of the second month, we have Exodus chapter 16. It's speculated. People are trying, you know, scholars trying to figure out how long were they there at Elim. And it seems like it could be anywhere between several days to perhaps a week or so. Imagine enjoying a week or so, even enjoying three days or so, of this oasis in the middle of the wilderness, after you've just spent the last three days knowing what the wilderness is really like. And then imagine the time, the call, the message. Now there's a million of them, so how do you get the word across? They didn't have Facebook, they couldn't text each other. And obviously they had no loudspeakers. So the word had to spread person by person by person through the million people that tomorrow we are now leaving. Imagine getting that call. Well, it would be similar, but even a greater extent, when uh, I was working from home and I got the email on a Thursday. Tuesday we're going to be working back in the office. It's just kind of that, oh, I don't want to change. <laughs> I don't want to go back. This is kind of like kind of nice to stay home. Uh, I don't get my wife upstairs making fresh cookies in the oven, and uh, my my glass magically refills itself. This is amazing. I'm, I'm content here. Well, you know, here they're sitting there for however long they've enjoyed the wells, they've enjoyed the scenery, they've enjoyed the shade, they've enjoyed undoubtedly their time there in the lift. But it's time for them to move. It's time for them to move on. You know, here's the thing about our contentment that we can. Consider our own contentment. Sometimes we define our contentment based on, we'll say it this way, a lack of change. I can be content as long as nothing changes. If you follow me. I'm content as long as nothing changes. But if something changes, for instance, a, a, a difficult one to face, if something changes in my health, it's hard for me to be content. If I can't do what I once could do, that's hard. 
Uh, Larry, certainly. I'm not, I'm not by any means casting judgment on anyone, but I can't imagine what that's like. And how easy is it to be content when you've gotten news like that? Uh, whatever it might be, whenever our life seems to be going well, and then suddenly there's a, a speed bump and something changes in our life. Certainly for this virus, something has changed in our lives. And uh, those that once were content, something changed, no longer content. And, and so we almost uh, give ourselves a pass to have there. We, 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 we give our lack of contentment a pass simply because something changed. We, and, and we're not comfortable yet with that change. We have, to, we have to have an adjustment period here. Here they left a city or an area, not a city, it's not a city. We left an oasis. It's well watered and has shade by day. And however long they've been there, it's time for them to move. And look at verse 2. Oh, did I read all of verse 2? Or verse 1. And they took their journey from Elim. And all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, one month exactly after they left Egypt, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. Now, it's ironic that it's called the wilderness of, of sin. Um, there's so much that, uh, you know, my class I'm taking right now is Old Testament backgrounds. It goes into cultures and the political backgrounds and the, the monotheist, or not monotheist, the polytheistic uh, uh, things of the Old Testament. And, but let me, I might go on, but bear with me. This, I, think, I find this interesting, so maybe you will. Uh, remember when Abraham is with uh, his father, uh, what was it, Terah? Uh, there in the land of, where did he originally originate from? Arrows from the land of, it's two letters. Ur, yes, he's from the land of Ur. Ur was a hub center for the moon gods. And their polytheism of all of the ancient Near East, uh, they worshipped all sorts of different gods. And, and if you were a follower of the moon god, you lived in Ur. Terah takes his family and they leave Ur, not for the same reason that Abraham would later leave, but he moves his family from Ur, which is more towards nowadays, uh, if I recall, Syria. And he moves them to, you recall where they go from? Haran, which if we move to later when they're in the Promised Land, you have the Promised Land, and even the days of Christ, you have the Promised Land, you have Samaria, and then beyond Samaria, above Samaria, it's north of Samaria, is where Haran was. And so Abraham's family moves from Ur to Haran. Guess what Haran was? Another hub for the moon god. God comes to Abraham and says, hey, it's time for you to leave the land of your father. Now, what was the land of his father? It's actually back in Ur. But they've since moved to Haran. But the same god, the same theology, the wrong theology, the same polytheism, that took place in Ur is also taking place in Iran, and Abraham's father moved him from one hub center of this God to the other hub center of this God. God tells Abraham, leave it. You're done with it. And in fact, Joshua would even remind his people, hey, don't go back and serve the gods of your, of, of your forefathers, meaning even Abraham's father. Because in the promised land, they're getting right back to where they were. You know what sin was? As it's pronounced, it's a translated, kind of like a baptizo, Transliterated into English, baptized. Sin was a, uh, a Hebrew word of sin, is a moon god. Just found that very interesting. So, Abraham from Ur to Haran to Egypt, now out of Egypt, right back in another area of, of the moon god. Now, there's every force of nature had its own god. The God of the air, the God of the ocean, the God of water, the God of rain, the God of thunderstorms, the God of, of the plants, the God of heart. There was a God for every force of nature, whether great or small. Just, I find it intriguing that it's the moon. Every time it seems to be the moon. I, I don't understand that. But anyway, that's what, uh, we come to the wilderness of sin, we're again entering the area of, of a moon God. Uh, so here, verse 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel did what? Exactly what they did before they got to the land. Now they're picking it up again. We don't like this change, Moses. We want to go back. We don't like this. It'd be better for us in Egypt. It'd certainly be better for us in the land. But it is not better for us here. We don't like this. 
We don't like to change. We're content. Where we were, we don't like what we are now. Now, as, as we consider the very reality of our own lives, not, our contentment should not be based on, on uh, <laughs> or we don't get a pass because of change. Do we understand the reality of our contentment that is not focused on my exact scenario? Do we understand our reality of, of contentment when we are leaving that which we have now become comfortable with and we're moving into a new area, a new phase, a, a new routine of our lives of which we don't know and we're not comfortable? Do you realize that in so many years, that which we were once uncomfortable with, we're going to be uncomfortable leaving? That's how life goes. You know, there was, a, uh, there was a time that singing a hymn was considered liberal in churches. You don't sing hymns, you sing the songs. You don't sing hymns like this. Now churches are like, you can't take my hymns away from me. <laughs> uh, so what was once unacceptable begins to get accepted, and we begin to uh, like it. We become accustomed to it, and then we don't want to move the next chain. That's how life is. I guarantee you all through our life, every stage of our lives, uh, when we get into uh, uh, high school age, what we kind of like our early, there's something exciting about getting into high school and adulthood coming, but boy, there was something when we didn't have to worry. We didn't have tasks. We didn't have so many responsibilities. We didn't have so many. School wasn't the same. But then you get out of high school, you get into college, you get into life, you get into marriage, you have children, you get older, and you all those different stages of our lives, every one of them, we could almost look back and say, there's something about my last phase that I kind of like better than this one. There's always that adventure ahead, and you can't stop age, so it is what it is. But our lives are based on change. And where I once was, I've now grown accustomed to. I didn't like getting to Olim, but now that we're there, I like being there. I'm going to like being in the promised land, but I'm not going to like the point of getting there. And, and so here they are in verses 1 and 2 saying, this is not what we, uh, uh, this is not what we wanted. And I can dare say so many times in our lives, sometimes we live out that same thing. This is not, this is not what I wanted. There are American citizens today, now I think this virus is kind of taking a backseat to all the other chaos that's going on in our nation lately. But before that all took place, there were a lot in our nation that were very discontent because it wasn't what it used to be. We well, didn't like it. You don't like the new normal as we're being told. I don't like not being able to sing in church. I don't like being able to uh, give a handshake. There's a guy in our office this week, a salesman, and uh, walking down the stairs from upstairs, John and I, John Leader and I, to meet with this guy. John says, do you think that we should maybe just meet up front so we can keep our distance? Should we have our mask? And uh, I said, well, you know, let's just play it like here. This guy's, this guy's all excited about life and uh, doesn't seem to be intimidated by the virus. Then, uh, yeah, let's go to the conference room so we have a little privacy. But if he's kind of towering, the, or keeping his distance, he's standing at the door with a mask on, you know, and, you know, the whole oxygen tank on his back. We're going to just see the front. We're gonna, we walk into the front uh, lobby, and this guy jumps out of his chair and rushes. You know, have you ever met somebody that you don't have any idea what you're doing, and all of a sudden your hand is being taken? This guy comes rushing toward us and grabs your hand, and as he's wildly shaking your hand, and you're thinking, I don't think we can do this. I don't think this is a lot. I don't think this is all right. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> no, warning, warning. This is not what's supposed to happen. You know, the very reality is we have a change in our lives right now because of this virus. We have a change in our life right now because of our circumstance. We have a change in our lives. If we're not right now, it will soon be. How are we going to adjust to that change? My daughter to finish her junior year, knowing that they have one year left. We realize that next, at the end of the next summer, uh, they'll be heading off quickly. They're like counting the days. I don't know how to feel like as a father for that. They're counting the days so they can head off to college. And uh, we realize that our family once of seven will be George, <laughs> Josiah, Josiah and us. And that's a completely different change. It'll be to a one point quieter in some scenarios. Um, but it's going to be different. It's going to be changed. And so every time we have a life change, does our contentment change as well? Do we think we get a pass because of a change? 
I don't have to be content because I didn't ask for this change. <laughs> there, ultimately, that's what they're saying. We don't have to be content with this because we didn't ask for this. This is not what we asked for. This is not, we're not the one that said, you know what, we're tired of Omer, let's go. We're not the one that said, you know, we're tired of Egypt, let's go. This has been God every time of the way. We're not happy with this. We don't like this. We're not going to be content. Continuing on, verse 2. The whole God of all your verse 3. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the flesh ports, and when we did eat bread to the full, for he had brought us forth in this wilderness and killed this whole assembly with hunger. Now, wasn't it the reality that in Egypt they were being beaten? Wasn't that the reality that Moses fled for his life from Egypt because he killed somebody that was beating one of his own? Wasn't that the reality that in Egypt it wasn't the best scenario? It wasn't the best environment. But isn't it amazing about when we look back at what we once had? What is it that we always remember? Yes. Only the good stuff. Oh, we were able to eat back in Egypt. Oh, yeah, you could barely hold your hand up because you were beaten to death. And, and uh, you didn't hardly have the strength at the end of the day, especially after they took away all your supplies. Do you remember that, children of Israel? Remember when they took away your supplies and you had to build your own bricks, but the, the product level had to stay the same? Do you remember that? No. What we remember is, oh, we ate so well. Clearly they were, the, 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 here's the very beginning point of the Baptist denomination. The food. We remember we had good food. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them. That sound familiar? How many times has God said that? That I may prove them. Whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto all the children of Israel, At evening then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out from the land of Egypt, and in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord, for he that for that he heareth your murmuring against the Lord, and what are we that ye murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, so that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, Moses said, but they're against the Lord. And Moses spake unto Aaron, and say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. They came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. And what's the, what's the reason? What's the important part here? Ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. Here's another point of our contentment. It's, it not, it's our contentment or our lack of it at times is not determined by whether I'm comfortable or I'm going through something that is changing my current scenario. That's not what contentment is based on. We don't get a pass just because something changed in our life in regards to our contentment. Secondly, it's not based on our, our demands. You remember a little later as the people are again murmuring something they learned to do very well. And uh, Moses beats the daylights out of a rock to get water. I guess he literally beat the water out of the rock. That's how that worked. How, why was Moses responding that way? In fact, that was the reason why Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. What was it that he was responding to? The people's complaining. Ever been into a grocery store and, and uh, can I just say Walmart? It's called Walmart. It's always everything happens at Walmart. There's a, a kid's belly aching and screaming their heads off that they want this or that, and uh, what often happens with the mom or dad or whoever is there, gives it to them. And you kind of just want to kind of go up there and kind of give them what it was my grandpa always said, a cracker on the head. So what are you doing? You know that you do this now, the next time you go, they're going to do the same thing because they now know they do this, I get it. And so you kind of want to just, don't do that. So why are you doing that? You're, you're destroying your kids. Why, why, why do that thing? You know, Moses was responding as so many parents do. He heard the people complaining, and why is he answering their dilemma? Why is he responding the way he did, or will, at this point? Because he wants them to stop. He's frustrated. 
Kind of like a parent gets frustrated, so I'll, I will give this to you if you'll stop screaming your head off. Why, this is important, why is God responding to their murmuring? They know him. God was not saying, I've had enough with your complaining already. Have who just eat. Why is God responding to their complaints? He's responding to their complaints so that their contempt would not be based on, am I hungry or am I not hungry? He's responding to them so that they were, their contempt would be based on, I know my God. Period. End of discussion. Now, they aren't learning that right away. In fact, immediately they did. they're failing in this. But it's not to be based, our contentment is not to be based on my demands. And God doesn't respond based on my demands. God, I want, therefore you better. Why does God work in our hearts and our lives, even in the midst of change for us? So that we too will know him. During the first time, the middle of March, when suddenly our state closed the doors and said, they literally closed the doors of our own homes, said no more coming outside anymore. Have you been able to see God at work still, even in the midst of something that many could easily say it was an injustice, uh, even in the midst of what some would say this is contrary to our state constitution and federal constitution? Were you able to see God doing things that only God could do, even in the midst of these last three months that you can only acknowledge that was God. That I wasn't necessarily enjoying the whole thing that we're now going through, but I can still see God. Why was God still working? He wasn't doing it trying to keep us happy, trying to keep us filled. <laughs> he wasn't doing it just so that we stop complaining. Why was God doing it? It's the same reason as he was there. Why does God continue to do what he does today? So that we would know who he is. A lot of times our contentment today is based solely on, here's what I imagine I have to have, and if I have this, I'll be content. And so, Lord, fix this problem so I will be content. And, and we have to remind ourselves that God's basis of fixing our problems has nothing to do with whether or not I'm content, because our contentment shouldn't even be rooted in that. My contentment should be rooted in him. And, and it should be, it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter how big the change is. It doesn't even matter how unconstitutionally incorrect this is. I, I think that's a double negative to the point. Constitutionally incorrect, not unconstitutionally incorrect. Constitutionally incorrect this is. Uh, it doesn't, those things don't matter as far as what God is doing. Now, we can justify the point that under our laws, obviously it doesn't matter. But by our God, that, that's just a circumstance. And God is still working to show us who he is. A God who never changes. Our lives will change. Our God never will. And regardless of what changes in our lives, we ought to be able to see our God doing what only God can do. And it's not, we have to keep this in our minds, this is not just so that we can continue to be fat. <laughs> Our God does that so we can be continue to be reminded of who He is. Period. That's the objective. Contentment is not based on my demands. I can't tell you how many times that we were amazed at what God was doing in these last three months. Things weren't going well for anybody in our nation. Any citizen was probably enjoying our time uh, in lockdown. But it's amazing when you're able to see what God was still doing. And a lot of times, I think it was because we were looking for what God was still doing. Last summer, we went to the uh, Chicago Air Show. Well, I went several times growing up. It wasn't that far for us then. I think you could just take the train from Donner's Grove and get off at the Union Station and walk to the shoreline and, and uh, watch the air show. We went a couple times in junior high, high school years. And uh, we went once since we've been married. And uh, last summer, the Blue Angels, and I've always loved the Blue Angels. Uh, the Blue Angels were in Chicago. We were like, so let's just take the kids. This will be fun. So at the end of the summer, we went in. One of the things that the Blue Angels, if you ever, in fact, probably most uh, aerial shows do this, but the Blue Angels do it well, is uh, those are six of them, six of them plus 
10 over, I think this explains. And uh, they all divide, well, they'll do several passes that's the information of six of them, and then they'll do missing man, where one of them shoots off, and just all kinds of cool things. But then usually in the show, they will do something where they'll, three of them, they'll split in half. And three of them will do one of these passes that goes right in front of you. And it's just one of those, your ears are ringing, but you can't help but say, awesome! And so here, they, here it comes. So we're watching this, and we had such a short because of the weather. They cut down there, it was like a 45 minute show down to about 15 minutes. And so they did one of those, you know, three of them go, and, and your, your ears are still ringing, but your, your, your heart is saying, that was so cool. And then you, you, you're you watching, they're coming from, from our vantage point, they came from the north, so heading down the beach of the north, like Wisconsin. They're coming from Wisconsin and they fly right down low altitude, low ceiling, right past us at a high rate speed so that you know, they've they got to be just under the 776 miles an hour to break the sound, man. They are just, they're cooking. And you see them go off that way, so you're watching them that way. You're assuming that they're going to spin around and come back. So you're, everybody's facing south, which for me is a perfect way here. Everybody's facing south, watching where they just went. And then what happens? What happened, Does I remember? As you're standing there on the beach, the city is behind you. So all these huge buildings are right behind you. Water's in front of you. They've just come from the north. They head off to the south. And I know I'm pointing the wrong direction, but for the sake of where I'm, how I'm standing. They come from the north. They've headed off to the south. Cities behind you. You're all looking at the distance, waiting for them to turn around and come back, just wondering what they're going to do. All of a sudden, three more planes. The other three come from, from the city. And uh, like barely covering the tops of the, the buildings downtown. And then kind of drop down right in front of you over the water, and you see the water going, and, and it, it, it literally stops your heart because it is so loud, and your your focus is this way. That's where the three planes just went. Where are they? Are they coming back? Anybody see them? And you see people like stepping out, looking out, trying to look past the crowd, and, and suddenly, right over the top of your heads, scares the daylights. I think 37 people had a heart attack in that moment. You know, here's the reason why we don't see God at times. Because we're looking this way. Where'd he go? What happened, God? This is not what I want. It's not where I want to go. Why did you bring us here? This is not what we want. And we're looking this way. Where did God go? We liked him when he brought him to live, but where's he bringing us now? Where is he? And we're completely oblivious to the fact that here he comes. Except God doesn't come with uh, supersonic jets. Sometimes it's just a small, small voice. And if we're looking this way, there's a lot of times we're missing what God is doing because we're discontent. We're looking here instead of what God is doing right here. And I can tell you this, there are a lot of Christians that were looking north, south, east, west, whatever direction it was. They were looking at their government. They were looking at this. They were looking for the changes of the laws. They were looking for... Uh, an attorney to help bring sense to this all. They were looking this way. But in the meantime, they missed out on what God was doing right there with them and for them. God did not answer their request. <laughs> because he was tired of hearing them complain. God answered the request because, I want you to know, in fact, verse 4 says, to prove their obedience to me, verse 6, remind them that it is he that delivered them. Verse 7, to show them the glory of the Lord. Verse 12, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. God repeatedly is saying, hey, here's the reason why. Here's why I'm doing this, so that you know me. Very quickly, I'm not going to read all the rest of the verses, but chapter, or verse 13 of the end of the chapter, we know what happens. Can you imagine being told every morning, now you're getting hungry, you've left an oasis, you've had a change in your life, Things are not the way that they used to be. And I'm having a hard time adjusting to my new normal. They're facing a new normal. We're having a hard time adjusting to a new normal. And one of the things that we don't have that we used to have is, is food. We are hungry. God says, I will give you food so that you know who I am. That I am the Lord your God. Imagine, here I'll put in my last point, is our contentment should not be based on needs. It seems very similar to our demands, but let, let me explain it this way. 
Imagine being the children of Israel, at, standing in their shoes. They're told, all right, you're hungry. I'm going to give you food. Tomorrow morning, when you wake up, there's going to be dew on the ground. Watch that dew. It's going to dry up, and it's going to leave this white wafer on the ground. Go out and only collect enough for you and enough for every person in your family, but nothing more. How many of us would be content with only collecting what was necessary? I am hungry. And Lord, you took us to a spot of great uh, food and water and all of that in Egypt. You've taken us into the wilderness for three days. We didn't like that. That was not what we wanted. You took us to a spot that had water, but it was horrid water. And their memory, they're thinking, not all water is good. Feel this in your own head. Not all water is good. We've tasted it. It's not good. It wasn't pleasant at all. Then God brought us to a spot that had amazing water, lots of wells, lots of waters. In fact, it even had palm trees. And that was an oasis in the middle of the wilderness. It was an amazing reality, still there today. In fact, Caitlin, after the message last week, looked it up. And many trees right there and, and what is assumed is, is a limb in the middle of nowhere. And then God takes them back into the wilderness, this time from the wilderness of Shur, now to the wilderness of sin. And uh, in the wilderness of sin, these people are saying, we're hungry. We're not just thirsty, we're hungry. God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide you enough food, but only collect enough for you. What happens? What do they do? They got, some of them collected more. What happened when they collected more? The worms, and it stunk. There's nothing worse than stinky, rotting food. It takes forever. Now, I'm, they're not living in homes at this point. But it takes forever to get that stink out of your nose. So how long do you think it took them to realize, let's not do that again. I'd get one time. Collected too much. Oh, this is nasty. Now, let's imagine being told on the sixth day you have to go out and you have to collect twice as much. Seven years, so in same, same shoes. Only collect enough. Kind of a little greedy. I want to have a little surplus. I want to make sure that I don't go hungry. There it is. There's plenty of it. It's everywhere. I'm going to collect more than I need in hopes that I won't ever be hungry again. And so I collect, and then it all rots. It gets warm. It stinks. Not doing that again. Except on the sixth day, they're told to. How easily will you go out and collect two days' worth when you've already done that, tried that, and it didn't work? What did some of them do? They didn't. Honestly, can you argue with them? I did that already. Let me tell you, the steak is a steak you'll never forget, and I can't imagine going and eating something that was full of worms, or thinking you were going to eat something that was full of worms. Uh, another one said many years ago, uh, well, I had one of those things. Hershey Kisses. Often have a candy jar, and, and mostly for my kids when they come to visit. And uh, many years ago, I want the cherry tree. So in those, the, the first phase of Leaser Agency, uh, I had a jar of Hershey Kisses. And uh, uh, was that? Is it in your drawer or something? Yes, it was in my drawer, so it wasn't even in a jar. It was in my drawer. I was hiding it from my coworkers. So it was in a drawer, and I pulled one out, and for whatever reason, I only, I heard these kisses very small, only half of it. You know what was in the half that does it? Was a, it was a worm. I kid you not, I have not had a Hershey's kiss since then. There is nothing grosser, is that even a word? There's nothing worse, nothing worser than the food that you intend to eat. I mean, it's one thing to go and, you know, you pull out the bread and it's moldy. Aww. Then eat that fast and I'll be thrown away. Nothing worse than pulling out food and it's got worms in it. Here's what you want to do. Only take enough for today. Well, that's hard to do because I'm used to being hungry. I'm going to gather a little bit more. Now i got wormy food that stinks. I am never in my life going to do that again. As I can attest to, I will never probably again in my life eat a Hershey's kiss. Won't do it. Can't do it. We've had them that are healthy for it. I look at them like, oh, chocolate stuff. Nope, I can't do it. Any other form of chocolate, I'll be glad to eat, but not a Hershey's Kiss. I tried that once. It didn't work. Yuck. Not doing it. On the sixth day, you need to take a double amounts. And understandably, there's some that are saying, uh, I don't know. 
surely God will provide it tomorrow morning as he did the last seven days, or six days, five days, whatever it was. They wake up on that seventh day and there's no dew. There's no dew that turns into that unknown wafer on the ground. There's nothing there. You know why they were hungry? Because they didn't obey. You know why they were suffering on that last day, a day of rest? A day that should have been a time of rejoicing what God was doing? They were instead grumbling in their stomachs because they were hungry because, well, they didn't do what God told them to do. There are times that I think, to kind of wrap this up quickly here, there are times that in our contentment even, and even in our trust of God, we're going to commit to, I'm not going to be looking down this way where God went. I'm going to be looking right here. Because God is right here. He's going to be working right here. And so we're not going to be focused on my demands of what I think I need and where did God go and why is he meeting those needs. Let's have a mentality that says, all right, God, from right here, right now, what are you doing? Let me see it. Well, there's a lot of times there's an instance in our hearts and our lives there's a, an intelligence to that. A mentality that kind of begins to believe then that when God works, ultimately what he's doing is he's putting food in my mouth. And we become like little baby birds. Mouth wide open, chirping up a storm. God I'm waiting for you any time now. Because I think it's very significant and worth pointing out before we leave this chapter. It's an interesting that God, the creator of the universe, could he not have done some sort of miracle that every morning they woke up and somehow they were nourished and felt full? So there are those that are going through. Uh, uh, I've heard that like chemo. When you go through chemo or different treatments, you just always have a sensation of being full. Couldn't God have done some means within themselves that every morning they didn't, they didn't have that hunger pain, they just felt full? Couldn't God have done that? Couldn't God, as the creator of the universe, been able to do some miraculous means that they didn't have to eat? They could have been nourished enough as they went through the wilderness. God could have done that. I have confidence that God could have done that. But I find it very intriguing that what God did do was this. At night, your food's going to be out there. It's going to land right in your yard. You need to go out and get it. In the morning, you go out and the dew, early morning dew, is going to turn into wafers on the ground. But you got to get it quick because if the sun gets it, it's going to just dissolve and disappear. So you've only got a short window of time, but you've got to go out there and get your food. I think there's an amazing reminder to us that there are times that we say, all right, God, what are you going to do? And we take our seat in the pew, figuratively. We take our seat in the pew and just kind of cross our arms and say, all right, I'm not doing anything. I'm to wait for God. I'm not looking down the road and see where God went, like, you know, those airplanes just went. Uh, I'm going to know that God's going to do something, so all right, God, let's just do it. I'm going to wait for you. And we sit, we sit, and we sit, and we wait. And our contentment begins to slowly mold itself or, or change itself into discontentment because we've been waiting and God, you're not, you're not doing, you're not providing, you're not, you're not accomplishing what I thought you were going to accomplish here. What are the signs that as does God say in our lives? Here's the answer. But you've got feet, you've got hands, you've got a brain, you've got you, you've got the energy, you, you've got to do your work, you've got to do your part. I will provide, but you've got to do your part. You've got to do your work. That happens for every aspect. For ministry, I you know a lot of us. Well, God says it. it's God that builds a church. It is indeed God that builds a church. Is it not? That's biblical. Does that mean we do nothing? There are a lot of areas in our life where we kind of get a uh, go from contentment to discontentment because we don't feel like God's doing what we thought He should be doing. But ultimately, it is that our needs, what we think we need, does not equate to what God has actually done. And he's provided it right there in front of us. And it's a stark reminder at times. You know, can you imagine? I, I got to the age, and I never understood this my grandpa, how and he was a retired guy, but he was always up so early. And why do you do that? You don't have to get, you know, here I'm a kid, I'm a teenager or whatever, and you know, if I don't have to go to school or work in the morning, what do you, what, do you, what is it that is on the outwritten code book that you're supposed to do in the morning if you don't have somewhere to go? You sleep in. That's what you do, Grandpa. 
When we go and visit them, we they had no extra bedroom for us. All four of us boys would sleep in the uh, living room. And uh, they'd all go to bed. We'd finally get to bed. And then, you know, 4.30 in the morning, here comes Grandpa turning on the TV. Grandpa, huh? we're sleeping. Well, we were sleeping. Grandpa, <laughs> it's 4.30. And I thought to myself, I'd never get to that age. Here I am, every morning. Weekend, I can't sleep in anymore. But could you imagine here they are every morning, every morning before the sun gets to do, you go out and collect, you sleep in, you've lost it. You want to do it on your terms, it won't be there. You want to do it when you want to do it, it's not there. You want to collect more so you don't have to get up tomorrow morning, it won't work. You don't want to collect double because you're suspicious that it's not actually going to do what I said it's going to do. It, that won't work either. You know, it's, I, I love that our God is a God that is a faithful God that is always there and He never changes. But I'm, I'm concerned at times of my own heart and our, our collectively of our own hearts when, when we continue to say to our God, why aren't you doing what I think you should be doing? How? When? I think you should be doing it. Our contentment. Respond to our chaos, we need to know what true contentment is. Ultimately, the question that I have at the bottom of the screen there, do we see God? Do we see him? Can you see him through this? And whatever the next stage is, can you see him through that? When we go to our, our prayer requests, I can advance this couple here. When we go to our prayer requests, many times I will pray that they will be able to see you. Because ultimately the, the, the solution isn't just having manna in the yard. The solution is realizing who God is in the manna in the yard. Being able to know what he is, who he is, that he is indeed the Lord. And our contentment needs to be in a God that never changes and set up in a life and a circumstance that always will. Do we see God? Let's pray. Let me thank you again for your word. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for... Uh, while we don't go through the same wilderness of sin, the same desert, so to speak, that the children of Israel went through, while many times here, and especially in, the, in our nation, we don't know what it's like to be hungry and thirsty. But we thank you that there are times that we go through the same similar journeys and you are always there, not providing for us because you're tired of us complaining, but providing for us because you long for us to know who you are that we know what our contentment ought to be in. And I pray that you would challenge that, us in that regard, that as changes come in our life, and they will, I pray that we'd be content in you, not rooted in us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that promise. We thank you for that hope. And I pray that we live our lives that bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>